So um, I'm just here to introduce um, the venerable Thukten Chodron, an old friend. And um, I see many of you here, I think, are here especially for her, and some of you are here for our longer term course. And um, as you know, and those of you who are here for the longer term course, tonight was to be the night we would be discussing the Sangha, the Buddhist community. And then it so happened that uh, Thukten Chodron was here. And the way things synchronized, it seemed to be really appropriate to invite her to be the, not to just talk about the Sangha, but to have a representative and a very noble one of the Sangha to address you all tonight. And I think there are a number of people here, especially her students, which is wonderful. And um, so she is, um, is uh, manifesting the Sangha to us all tonight. We're very honored about that. And, um, uh, so, but she's not necessarily going to give that sort of technical description of the Sangha. She's going to do whatever the Sangha does, which is do whatever, <laughs> do whatever they feel should be done for the, for the benefit of the group at hand, you know, which I think is what they do. Mm -hmm. So um, I just did give her a copy. Oh, did you have bring it with you? Oh, you didn't bring it with I you. I left it in there. I gave her a copy of the uh, Sublime yeah. Continuum book, and we were looking up some, some question that she asked me about the yeah. jewel of the Sangha which I couldn't answer, and we tried to look it up in the book. <laughs> so I forgot it. the answer. So okay. uh, I turn it over to you. Okay. And thank you so much for coming. Oh, thank We're you, Bob. And, thank uh, you. So I leave, it, I leave it to you, and uh, enjoy. Okay. Bob's a difficult act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even get my voice out there <laughs> to start with. Okay. So... Uh, now that you can hear me, we're going to uh, be silent for a few minutes <laughs> because I like uh, doing a, having a little bit of silent meditation before a talk because we've all been running around all day and so it's good to sit still and focus the mind before we go into the Dharma. So have your feet flat on the floor, your hands right on the left, the thumbs are touching to form a triangle and sit up straight. Okay. So, there's actually many ways to approach the topic of the Sangha. And I thought maybe I'd start out with a little bit of the history. Okay. Uh, as we know, the Buddha attained full awakening. And before he attained full awakening, he became a wandering mendicant, as there were many of those in India at the time. So he left behind his jewelry and his fine clothes and cut off his hair and, you know, took an alms bowl and went to it. He attained full awakening, and after he did, he was wondering, uh, you know, he wanted to share his experience with others, but he was thinking, nobody's going to understand what I talk about. You know, the people, their minds are... Uh, their eyes are covered with dust. They won't understand. So the gods of the world, Brahma and Sakra and so on, begged him and pleaded with him and requested him to teach. And so he agreed. And then, you know, wondering who to teach, he, uh, his first thought was his two previous teachers who taught him the meditations on samadhi. Uh, but he, they had just died, so he couldn't teach them. So he uh, thought about his five friends who he did the ascetic practices with. Remember, he did six years of ascetic practice and got so thin that when he touched his navel, he could feel his spine. Uh, so he decided to go teach them. Of course, those people thought that he was a big flake because he gave up the ascetic practices. So when they saw him approaching, they said, disregard this guy, you know? 
we practiced with him, but he was a softie and started eating again. And, you know, so we're not going to invite him to sit down or arrange a seat or anything. But somehow when the Buddha was coming there, uh, just his presence was speaking very loudly and automatically they found themselves offering him some water and preparing a seat. And so these uh, became uh, his first monastic disciples. After that, you know, as he traveled to different places to teach, more and more people came and many of them wanted to um, become monastics and follow, follow him, yeah. And others remained as lay followers and disciples of the Buddha. So there's this whole community building. And so this is where we get the idea of the fourfold assembly. Yeah. And the Buddha said that he wasn't going to pass away until the fourfold assembly was established in his doctrine. So the fourfold assembly, fully ordained monks, fully ordained nuns, okay? And then lay women who have the f refuge and the five precepts, and lay men who have the refuge and the five precepts. So these four groups made the fourfold assembly that the Buddha really cherished, and all of whom who cherished the Buddha. And he set up the relationship, you know, among the monastics, which were two of the fourfold assembly, who were called the Sangha, and the lay practitioners, you know, who were the other two, who had the five precepts. He set up a relationship between them that was quite interesting, because the monastics uh, were wanderers. This was the tradition in ancient India. So they lived a very simple lifestyle. Um, they weren't allowed to own more than 13 or 15 possessions. And they didn't uh, cook or grow their own food or prepare their own food. But instead, as was the custom in ancient India, is they had their alms bowl and they went from door to door and they didn't beg. Sometimes people call them, say they were begging with a begging bowl. That's not correct. They went on alms round and they had an alms round. And they had an alms bowl. So begging is you ask for money or you ask for food. They didn't ask. They stood there with their bowl if people wanted to give food, they gave. If they didn't, then the monastics would go on to the next door, hold their bowl there, and if people gave food, well and good. If they didn't, then they went on, okay? So it was, a, this tradition was established whereby the, the, the monastics were made very dependent on the lay community, yeah? Because in our precepts, we can't do uh, agriculture, we can't handle money, we can't do business of buying and selling, okay? A lot of this has been modified in behavior as time has gone on, gone on. But this was how the Buddha initially set it up. So the monastics depended on the lay people for uh, the four requisites, food, clothing, shelter and medicine. And then the monastics gave to the lay people the Dharma teachings. So there was this, uh, what we call an economy of generosity. Okay? I, and I find this so beautiful, the way the Buddha set it up. Because everybody is giving. The lay people give the material requisite, the Sangha gives the teachings. Everybody creates merit because everybody is giving with a virtuous aspiration, okay? So uh, 
you know, the Sangha did not charge for the teachings. The teachings were given freely. Yeah. The lay people gave food and clothing and whatever, yeah, without making demands, but simply out of the goodness of their hearts because they saw the value of what uh, the Sangha was doing and the lifestyle of the Sangha. So that's how the Buddha initially set it up. Yeah. Um, very soon after the Buddha passed away, uh, the Sangha, you know, stopped wandering quite so much. Yeah. And they began to be more settled in different places. Uh, so the wandering has some virtue to it in that everything's changing in around you and so you you don't have time or energy to get attached to anything because you're going on to the next village the next day okay but it makes it harder to really get into something because you're moving so much now when you stay still there's more Mm, it's easier to have attachment come up, but uh, it gives you more opportunity to really uh, go deeper in your practice because you, you're not moving around and walking so much. You can stay somewhere. Yeah. So over the centuries, you know, what happened is you started having the development of the monasteries, and some of them were quite small. As we know in Tibet, some of them became quite big. The largest one supposedly had uh, 10,000 um, monks, Drepung Monastery. So things, you know, changed a lot. And then the way the Sangha lived changed also according to the country the cli and its cli cli climate and culture. Uh, that it had. So in Southeast Asia, they could continue going on Pindapod, on the alms round, yeah? And, uh, and it was very easy because it's a warm climate. When the Sangha went to, to China, it was colder. And also, if they stayed in the cities, which is where you had to be to go on alms round, uh, where the people lived, then you got involved in politics, you know, and the whole um, bureaucracy, Chinese governmental bureaucracy. So they didn't want to do that. So they, the, especially the Chan practitioners, the Zen people, they went to the mountains. And uh, because they weren't living in the city, then they began to uh, grow their own food and cook their own food and so on. Okay, and also they changed the color of the robes because in China uh, only the uh, emperor could wear saffron or gold color, so they made it what they considered an ugly color, gray and black. So China, Korea, we have gray and black robes. In Tibet, you had this you know, incredible uh, flowering of the Sangha with a quarter of the male population of Tibet being monastics, and then a great, you know, a number of women also becoming monastics. And so if they were to go on alms round in the middle of the town, um, everybody would go broke, because the lay people would have to be cooking all day for so many people. So you know, the whole mechanism changed a lot. And people uh, in China and also in Tibet, many of them started bringing food to the temple, yeah, to the monasteries. That happens also in, in Southeast Asia as well. People offer food, to they bring it to the monasteries. But also in China and in Tibet, people began to donate land and then, um, you know, the monastics own the land, and that was another way that they received food. It wasn't set in the long term, it wasn't such a good idea, because this is what the communist 
said, you know, look, the, the religious people are owning the land and these people are serfs. And yeah, so in the long term, it, it really was not a good idea, but it did work to support the monasteries for some centuries, both in China and uh, in Tibet. Then we have this very interesting phenomena of Buddhism coming to the West. Yeah. And uh, especially to Protestant mo countries that are mostly Protestant, like the US, you know, it's different in Italy, France. Uh, well, even between Italy and France, it's quite different, you know. But the Italians, for them, the whole idea of Buddhist monastics, no problem. Yeah, because they had Catholic monastics. So very, very easy. You know, the French, they had Catholic monastics, but they were also pretty secular. Yeah, and they, sometimes they didn't want so much from monastics. Uh, the British, you know, like that. The Germans, much more Protestant, although in South Germany you have the Catholic monastics. In any way, in any case, when Buddhism started coming to the West, which really wasn't that long ago, yeah, it wasn't that long ago, uh, then there were some Westerners who wanted to take robes and become monastics. And uh, when they put on the robes and were walking around in Western society, um, people didn't know what in the world we were, okay? So I've been a nun 40 years now. When I, uh, I was ordained in India and I lived there for, you know, some years. When I came back to America, I remember uh, walking around, going to His Holiness's teachings, and people saying, Hare Krishna? I said, no, not Hare Krishna. <laughs> okay. And, um, you know, then when we tried to explain that, you know, we weren't permitted to work and, and things like that, and that we received our livelihood by donation, a lot of the people coming from a Protestant culture said, what are you talking about, you know? This is not the free lunch club, and you should go out and get a job and go to work, just like the rest of us, you know? We're not here to support you. Uh, I mentioned the, th the free lunch club. This is Bob's um, uh, terminology, yeah, what he calls the Sangha, and he says it with a lot of respect and a lot of uh, gentleness, you know, and appreciation. But uh, for most of us, um, people's comments were not said that way so much. So there's a whole period of negotiation, you know. How do you live as a Sangha member in the West? And especially, um, what is the difference between being a Tibetan Sangha member and an Inji, Western? They called us Inji's in India. I think that's how you, uh, a corruption of English. Yeah, so we were the Inji's. Yeah. So how, how do you, you know, Tibetans, well, they're refugees and, you know, they're from Shangri-La, so they all must be nearly awakened and they're all holy beings, so you know, and they're poor refugees, so we will support them. But the Western Sangha, they grew up with Mickey Mouse, like the rest of, rest of us, so what in the world do they know? Yeah, and they should go out and get a job. <laughs> so, yeah, so it, interesting situation, yeah. But the idea is, the, the word Sangha, um, refers to a collection, refers to a group, okay? And so when we ordain, we are joining a group. And this group has certain guidelines that you have to follow to belong to it. And these are our precepts, okay? So there are different levels of precepts. 
Some of them are quite major. If you transgress those completely, you're out. Others of them are more minor, and so you confess them and you make amends to the community, or you make amends uh, with one other Sangha member. Okay, so there's different things like that. But it's meant to be a community. And, and that's really important, you know. Wherever we look in all the different countries where Buddhism exists, there's a monastery. Yeah. America is short on monasteries. We tend to have Dharma centers here. But there's a big difference between a Dharma center and a monastery. Yeah. And people may not always uh, recognize that, yeah, unless you've lived in Asia and seen how Asian society functions with the monasteries. So there's, a, there's quite a big difference. And also, the role of the, um, the way the Sangha and the lay people relate to each other nowadays, especially in the West, is also changing. Um, because before, it, you know, in other cultures where there wasn't literacy uh, throughout the society, the monastics had more education and, you know, the lay people were often illiterate. <clears throat> and so they, uh, they went to the temples, they heard the oral teachings, they did some simple meditation practice, but they couldn't study the texts because the society didn't have universal literacy. Yeah. In the West, you know, we have that. And so we also have lay people who are not content just to, um, you know, to make offerings and do simple meditation, but are, are really, uh, you know, want to be scholars of the Dharma, want to be long-term practitioners and make commitments to, to Buddhist practice. So you have this kind of change going on, you know, nowadays too, that is, is something to negotiate. Yeah. In, in Tibetan society, it's still pretty traditional, the roles of the, of the monastics, the roles of the, of the lay people. Although I've seen the monastic role in many ways, um, some of the monasteries, since they had to go into Tibet to be um, into India as refugees, then they needed more money, and so some of the monasteries have opened businesses, or they run hotels or restaurants or whatever. So it's another change, you know, that's happening. With Buddhist, Buddhism coming to the West, yeah, with Dharma centers, they all have their own way of, of doing things. Yeah, most of them charge for teachings because they have expenses and they're, they're uh, afraid that, that living on donations will, will not cover their expenses. We don't have very many monasteries um, in the West. Shravasti Abbey, where I live, is one of the Tibetan monasteries. We have several Theravada monasteries where Westerners live. We have many Chinese monasteries for the, the Chinese practitioners. Um, but not so many Tibetan monasteries. There may be a few Tibetan monks living here and there, but really having monasteries where Westerners um, can train, very few. And so Shravasti Abbey is one of them. And so in, in setting it up, um, I wanted in many ways to go back to the way things were, the Buddha set it up, where the Sangha was dependent on the lay people, yeah, for food. And so uh, we began the monastery in 2003, and I said, we aren't buying any food. We're only eating the food that people offer to us. And the monastery's out in the middle of nowhere. And people said to me, you're going to starve. <laughs> you know? Nobody knows you're here, and even if they know, they're not going to bring you any food. So I said, you know, and also we live in a, um, our area 
is uh, fairly redneck. Yeah, a redneck area. Do people use that term nowadays? Yeah, okay, yeah. So it's, yeah. It's a redneck area in a blue state. But, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so people said, you're gonna starve. I said, let's try. Let's just try. So, uh, I'll, I'll come back and talk about Sangha. Don't worry, I'm just giving you some stories right now. So, um, uh, we moved in. The original residents of the Abbey were me and two cats. And uh, when we moved in, um, somebody had filled the refrigerator in the cupboard. And uh, then people stayed and helped us... Um, you know, move some furniture in and get started and so on. And then the guests left and it was me and the two cats. And, uh, and somehow every week some food showed up. Yeah. There was only one time, I think, in the first year that the refrigerator was empty but there was still some canned food in the, in the cupboard. And that's as low as things got. But for 14 years, yeah, with an increasing population, we now have 17 full-time residents, plus some guests, and four cats. <laughs> um, we've never starved. We've never starved. Yeah. And it's really kind of amazing. When you depend on other people for your food and you don't go buy your own food. The, you know, the whole meditation on the kindness of others takes on a very different meaning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you can't, you don't go out to the food and, you know, oh, I feel like having chocolate chip cookies today. You don't go out to the grocery store and buy them. And you don't say, you know, we're really low on vegetables, so let's go out and buy some. We don't do any of that, you know. So we use what's there, we use what people bring. Many times people ask us what we need and we tell them. But we feed the monastic community and all the guests who come to visit us, okay, um, without charging anything. And it's all this economy of generosity. But it makes you feel so grateful to other people because the food you're getting, you're quite aware, you know, this didn't come from me. This came from other people's hard work. Yeah? And we have an obligation, you know, when we receive food, to keep our precepts. That's our end of the bargain, yeah, to keep our precepts, and to be a benefit to people, and by teaching and counseling and so on, yeah. So it, it gives you, it, it changes your life in, in, uh, in a way that I think is very helpful for Dharma practice, yeah. Okay, so that is just a little bit about how we live, yeah. But to, to talk about Sangha and this whole thing of living in community, because I think lay practitioners also want to have community. And this is my experience in, in teaching in many, many Dharma centers is, you know, people want to have a community in this country, but they don't know how to make community. And we also tend to be a little bit leery of community. And I see this also with some of the Westerners who ordain. Yeah, like, well, I want to live in community, but I also want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Yeah, because we're individuals in America, you know, and in the West in general, but especially in this country. And to form a community, whether it's at a monastery or a dharma center, you have to give up some element of your own trip. And we don't like to do that. 
Yeah? We don't like to do that. But learning how to give up our own trip is really helpful for our Dharma practice. Really, really helpful. Okay? Because the mind that is centered on doing our own trip, okay? And so, like in a monastery, it always comes out this way. You know, we have a daily schedule. Well, I don't like the daily schedule. We have to get up at 5. I want to get up at 5.15. And the other person said, but I want to get up at a quarter to 5. And, you know, one person says, an hour and a half is too long for meditation in the morning. And the other person says, actually, it's too short. I want it, you know, to be long. <laughs> and, you know, breakfast is at 7.30. Why is breakfast at 7.30? I want it at 7. I want it at 8. Yeah? Then there's chores to do. Oh, how come I have to do these chores, you know? Somebody else does other chores. I have to do these. Yeah, they get the good chores. I get the bad ones. Even though it's all on a rota system and you change chores all the time. Still, our self-centered mind, you know, just runs the show. Yeah, we want what we want when we want it, and we want to do what we want to do when we want to do it. And this is, you know, it's fine having preferences. Having preferences is no problem. But when we get attached to our preferences and we become inflexible and we want everything done the way we think it should be done, then it's very hard to have a community. In fact, it's very hard to have a marriage and a family. Yeah? And we can see this by the divorce rate. Yeah? So this whole thing of giving up our trip is actually conducive for our, our Dharma practice and conducive for human harmony. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. Because we are, we're so attached to every small thing. You know, we think, you know, I'm not attached to this. Yeah. I remember when I, when I lived in India, I had these old run-down shoes, plastic shoes that were falling apart. I'm not attached to these shoes. And then one day when I was in Bodh Gaya, I left them outside the temple because I was going around and I came out and they were gone. Boy, was I attached to those beat up plastic <laughs> shoes. I wanted them back. <laughs> yeah. Our attachment is so sneaky. Yeah. So to really be part of a community, we have to be willing to let go of some of those things and realize that it is not challenging our independence as an adult. And it's not lessening our, um, our self-respect. That actually we can live without having our way all the time. Wow. Can you imagine if I said that on the TV? Yeah. In the country, the way the country is right now? Nobody wants to compromise on anything. Yeah. Everybody wants everything their way. My way or the highway, as they say. And look where we're at as a country because of it. Okay. So this self-centered thought, when you, to make a community, it has to go down. <laughs> yeah. So we have a, a, a little uh, 
thing that we tell people when they come to the Abbey to live. Many times lay practitioners come and live at the Abbey too. And we say, there's three things you're not going to like here that nobody likes. Number one, the schedule, the daily schedule. You're going to want to change it. Forget it. We're not changing the schedule. Second thing you aren't going to like is the way the kitchens run. Nobody likes the way the kitchens run. One person thinks we, it, we keep it too dirty. The next person thinks we're too fanatic about keeping it clean. Nobody likes that. Third thing you're not going to like is how we do our, our prayers, our liturgy, our practices. Some people want to do them silent. Some people want to do them out loud. Some people want the chanting a higher pitch, and some people want it a lower pitch, and some people want it faster, and some people want it slower. So if there's those three things, and if you live here, you're not going to like any of them. Yeah. But if you can be at peace without liking those three, then you'll be very happy living here. Yeah, we tell people that right at the beginning, okay? And it, it's always true. It's always true, you know? When we hold on to our ideas and we push for our way, yeah, it becomes impossible for us to live with other people. Yeah. So even in a Dharma center where people may not live together, although in some... Dharma centers, you know, in the countryside, they run it as a retreat center, then the people live together. So you, ha you have that same thing, yeah, of people trying to get along with each other. And everybody thinking they have the right idea. And it's not only that we think we have the right idea about big, important things, but also about little things. Okay. So I always joke, but it's not really a joke. Have you ever noticed when you live with other people, there are some people who put their cups upside down in the cupboard, and there are some people who put their cups right side up in the cupboard. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. How many of you are upside down people? How many of you are right side up people? Oh, so many of you are right side up people. You're wrong. <laughs> You're wrong. We should keep it upside down. That's the way my mother did it. Yeah. And the reason we kept everything upside down was so that the dust didn't fall into it. And then you're going to say, well, the reason we keep it right side up is in case the shelf is dirty so that the rim where you drink out of isn't on the dirty shelf. <laughs> so we are both doing what we're doing for the same purpose, but you're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah? And you know what? I'm not only attached to being right, I am attached to winning. I have to win. Yeah? I mean, that's what our press tells us. We have to be winners. We don't want to be losers. Yeah, we have to be winners. So have you ever noticed that sometimes in a discussion with somebody that is going towards being an argument, with that person? Have you ever noticed that you realize that your own position is wrong, but you keep arguing it anyway because you have to have the last word and be right? Any, any of you do that? Oh, two honest, truthful people. Uh, the rest of you, I'm sure you're very cooperative. And, you don't have to win arguments, you know. But most of us, yeah, we want to win, even if we're wrong.
We're never really wrong because we would never do anything wrong. All of our ideas are right ideas, even if I change what I think tomorrow. Okay? So whatever I think in one day happens to be the right idea because I would never think a wrong idea. So everybody should follow my ideas and I should win all arguments. Okay. Another thing that I'm attached to is I should always be comfortable. Yeah. I live in a wealthy country. I should always be comfortable. I should always see beautiful things, hear the kind of music I like, not my parents' music, not my kids' music. Yeah, my, the, my generation music. I want to smell nice things. I want to taste good food. And if the food's not good at a restaurant, I send it back. And the room has to be the perfect temperature. Not too hot, not too cold. Yeah, It's so hysterical. I don't know. Have any of you ever done long retreats with a group of Westerners? Yeah? Okay. So you're sitting in the retreat room, yeah, meditating. And then one person gets up and opens the window because they're too hot. And then 15 minutes later, somebody else stands up in the middle of session and goes and closes the window because they're too cold. Yeah. But everybody has to have the temperature their thing, their way. Yeah. Or you change the thermostat, even though at the center it says above the thermostat, do not touch. Yeah. We go ahead and we change it anyway, because we have to be comfortable. Yeah. And we have to have a bed that's not too hard and not too soft. Yeah. Everything has to be our way. So many times I've been asked to lead pilgrimages to India, you know, to the Buddhist sites. And I've always said no, because I think you need to be a full-fledged bodhisattva to lead a group of Westerners on <laughs> pilgrimage to India, where it's going to be uncomfortable, <laughs> yeah, where you're not going to have what you're used to, and it's hot, and it's sticky, and you get your, the traffic is worse than in Manhattan. Yeah. And the toilets don't always work. And the food is different and so on. So I've always said, no, I'm not leading. I might go next year. Some, they had asked me to come and be a teacher on a pilgrimage to, in Bhutan. So I think I might accept that, but I'm not leading it and taking care of those. I'm going to give them the advice about how to work with their mind so they can be happy on the pilgrimage. <laughs> yeah, that's what the Dharma does. You know, it teaches you how to work with your mind and how to make your mind happy in these conditions. Okay. So living in a community, whether it's a residential community or a Dharma center, you know, where you have to meet together and plan activities together and everything. You're working with other people. And so, of course, things are going to come up. We have different ideas and different problems. So we say it's like being uh, stones in a, a rock tumbler, you know? The, the rocks have really sharp, jagged edges, but as they get tumbled back and forth and back and forth, the rough edges get knocked off, and eventually they get polished and become beautiful gems. So that's what living in a community does for you. Yeah, your rough edges get knocked off. You say, ouch, each time, because each rough edge is 
something that is my preference that I want. Yeah. And you learn, you know, especially living in community, that it's not about you as an individual. Yeah. Especially Buddhist communities, religious communities. We don't live together for the benefit of my practice. Yeah. If it's only my practice that's important, I'm going to be miserable in a community. Yeah. It has to be for the benefit of the community. So the community has to have a long-term purpose, like establishing the Dharma in the West, spreading the Dharma to sentient beings, and some purpose that goes beyond ourselves as an individual. And because we support that purpose, everybody in the community supports that purpose. Then we learn to live together to accomplish our purpose together. And then it becomes quite beautiful. Yeah? Because you support the community and the community supports you. And you function together as a group of practitioners who are practicing in relationship to each other. So when, but this is something that it takes a while to learn. And you need to hear it many, many times over and over. The whole group you're part of needs to hear this many times over and over. That it's not about me, it's about our common purpose. When I first ordained, yeah, when I was a novice, a Getsilma or Shramanere, um, I was always thinking, what is good for my Dharma practice? Where shall I live where I will thrive and my Dharma practice will be good? Where can I get the kind of teachings from the kinds of teachers that I like? Where will I have enough support to live? Everything was thought about in terms of me and my Dharma practice. Yeah. Because in the Tibetan tradition they don't have the full ordination for women, I stayed as a novice for nine years and then I went to Taiwan to take the full ordination. So it was outside of the Tibetan tradition. And there, you know, when I became a bhikshuni, a, a fully ordained person, you know, they really taught you there. And as you study the Vinaya, the monastic code, it becomes very evident to you that you're joining a community and the purpose of doing that is not for the benefit of your own individual practice. The purpose is to sustain the Dharma for future generations. So you have to, you sustain the Dharma. Uh, there's two ways to speak of the Dharma, the transmitted Dharma and the realized Dharma. So the transmitted Dharma, they're the teachings, yeah, the texts, the oral teachings, uh, the instructions. So to make, to uh, preserve that for future generations, we have to study the texts. We have to study with live teachers. Uh, we have to think about the teachings that we hear, yeah, and make sure we understand them. We need to discuss them, yeah. And then, you know, we need to share the teachings with others to, to make the transmitted dharma go on to future generations. And as a monastic, we need to... Uh, and, well, let me, okay. Uh, then the other one is the realized uh, dharma. So that's the realizations in the mind stream. And it's the lived dharma. So it's also... The, the keeping of the precepts as, when you're a monastic. Yeah. So as a monastic, we have to keep our precepts, and many of our precepts concern how we live together as a community. And we have to meditate on the Dharma, 
and see if we can gain some experience because that's the realized dharma that needs to be continued. It can't just be the, the scriptures and the oral transmission. It has to be the realizations, you know. So, you know, for me, becoming fully ordained was this big wake-up thing of, you know, this is the responsibility of the sangha as a fully ordained person, you know. I, I was, it, it was just stupendous for me. I thought, because I wasn't able to take the full ordination in the Tibetan tradition, so I had to go to another tradition to do it. And to really think, you know, I'm able to take this, this ordination because 2,600 years of people kept the ordination lineage going. From the time of the Buddha, there were fully ordained nuns, and the lineage of ordination was passed down, you know, to the people who ordained me. And so I just kind of came along, and I'm writing like on the crest of the wave of the practice of 26 centuries of practitioners. And due to their kindness, I'm able to come along and take this ordination and learn the Dharma. And it's an incredible privilege. And it's an amazing responsibility because I'm depending on all these 26 centuries so now I've got to contribute to keep it going for future generations so that other people who come after me, who I'm not going to know, have the opportunity to learn the Dharma, to take the ordination. Yeah. So there was a huge change in my mind when I became fully ordained. You know, in the sense that I have some responsibility now. Yeah. And so it's not a thing of, you know, oh, the Dharma's coming to the West, so I'm going to change the Dharma and make it into Western Dharma so that everybody will like it. No, that's not my job. My job is to preserve the Buddha's teachings, to preserve the practice, to preserve the training. And we may need to make certain cultural adjustments on the way, but it's a task of preservation, not reinventing. Because if it were reinventing, I would be saying, that I know more and better than the Buddha. And I cannot do that because I definitely do not know more and better than the Buddha. Okay? So it's, it's very interesting uh, just to talk a little personally here. When I'm in the Tibetan community, yeah, I am seen as like radical left. Yeah, because I believe in things like gender equality in the Sangha. <gasps> yeah, radical left, gender equality. Yeah, and I also think that as Westerners, we should do our practices in English. We don't understand Tibetan. Why should we chant everything in Tibetan? Okay, we should do it in English. So, you know, when I'm in Asia, I'm like on the left. When I come back to America and it, with people here, I'm on the right, you know, the radical right, because I want to preserve what's been handed down. And I'm not thinking of reinventing it and changing it. And, you know, I'm not into this secular Buddhism thing of saying the Buddha didn't teach rebirth because he did teach rebirth. Okay? 
So it's, it's a quite interesting position, you know. Are you right? Are you left? Oh, well, I'm both, depending on who you're comparing me to. Also, because sometimes in, in America, just the fact that I'm a monastic, people say, you know, there's some people in this country who say, monasticism is old-fashioned. Yeah, because they're thinking, you know, maybe of the religions they grew up in or whatever. It's old-fashioned. It's a bunch of rules. It's totally hierarchical. We don't want hierarchy. And we want gender equality, and it doesn't have gender equality. So we don't want all this monastic rigorole, rigor, rigmarole. Yeah. So some people in the West say that. Yeah. So I just show up looking like this, and I'm mad. already they have a, you know, an image of me. A very interesting situation. Yeah. Then I should tell you also some other in, images people have of me. What, I mean, just what it's like to be a monastic in the West. So, for example, on my way coming here just a few days ago when I, I left the Spokane El airport, I was uh, giving her my, um, my ticket, you know, to scan so I can get on board. And she looks at me and she says, you're all matching, I love it. <laughs> And I've gotten other compliments, you know, from people who say, not everybody can wear their hair that way, but it looks really good on you. <laughs> yeah. And I really, I often get compliments on my outfit. Yeah, you, my outfit. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I get other, other things, uh, like... <laughs> I, when a flight attendant came and said, what would you like to drink, sir? <laughs> and I said, orange juice. And she said, oh, oh I mean, ma'am. <laughs> or sometimes I'm in the women's bathroom and somebody will walk in and go, <gasps> you know, because I have no hair, they think I'm a man. You know, I'm waiting. Uh, I dare not go to Texas, you know, if they pass the bathroom bill in Texas. You know, what are they going to do to me? They think I'm a man in the woman's loo. But, um, yeah. So it's quite interesting being a Sangha member in the West. <laughs> yeah. How people uh, relate to you. Okay. So that's a little bit about Sangha on the ground, okay? When we take refuge, yeah, when we're talking about the three jewels of refuge, Sangha has a very particular meaning, okay? There, Sangha we take refuge in, when we say I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha, the Sangha is the Arya Sangha those beings who have realized emptiness directly. Okay, so these are people who are very high, highly realized. They know the nature of reality yeah, directly with a mind that is the union of serenity and insight. Yeah. And their realization is such that they're never going to lose it. They're never going to forget emptiness, okay? They're going to progress on to full awakening. So that's the Sangha that we take refuge in. Or in a more general sense, including all the Buddhist traditions, you know, it includes the Aryas of, you know, who are following the hearer vehicle, the solitary realizer vehicle, the bodhisattva vehicle. So those are the people who are actually the jewel of sangha that we take refuge in. Okay? The representative of the jewel of, of sangha, the representation, is a sangha community of four or more fully ordained people. Okay? So the, the representative of the sangha jewel isn't 
even one person. It's got to be a community of four or more because many of the, the rites uh, and procedures that we to do together as a Sangha community, you need four people in order to accomplish them. If you don't have four people, you cannot act as a full-fledged Sangha. Okay? So for example, you know, unless you have four people plus a preceptor in outlying areas, you cannot give the ordination. Yeah. So there's many things like that where you have to have a, rec a requisite number of people. But even so, the community of Sangha is just the representation. We're not the actual jewel of Sangha. The jewel of Sangha could be one individual, whether they're lay or whether they're monastic, it doesn't matter, but they have realized emptiness directly. What's happened with Buddhism coming to the West is that the word Sangha is now very often used to refer to anybody who goes to a Buddhist center. It's a meeting of the Sangha. The Sangha is getting together. That becomes very confusing for people because when they hear we take refuge in the Sangha, you know, they don't think Arya Sangha and they don't think the community of monastics who are holding ethical precepts. They think Tom, Dick, Susan and Harriet who are coming to the Dharma Center. But Tom is married to Susan and sleeping with Harriet. And <laughs> Dick goes out and smokes some dope every night after the dark, you know, he and some other people go out and smoke some dope every night after the, the, the meditation session and then some other people go out and drink, you know, at the pub after the Sangha meeting and a newcomer comes in and says, I'm taking refuge in these people? <laughs> yeah? Kind of... They're my examples. <laughs> okay, so this is why I think just calling it the Sangha when you're referring to people at uh, a Dharma center can be very confusing for people. Yeah, and it's also confusing if you ask a Tibetan, if you have a Tibetan teacher there and you ask them questions about the Sangha, if you're thinking of the people at the center, and they're thinking of the Arya Sangha or the monastic community. You know, I remember one time uh, at one of His Holiness's teachings, somebody asked a question like that, and I could tell they were thinking about people at a Dharma center, and His Holiness was answering it like it pertained to a monastery. Yeah. Okay, so I think it's, it's better at a Dharma center to call it the Buddhist community. Yeah, I think that, that's easier. It doesn't get so confusing in terms of who or what you're taking refuge in. Yeah. Okay, so I've talked for quite a while. Um, what I'd like to do is open it up for comments and questions. Answers are not... Uh, um, a given, but I'll do my best. And it looks like there's a microphone for people who have questions. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. Um, I'm wondering whether you could tell us, um, uh, in very general functional terms, mm -hmm. um, how you would compare the Buddhist Sangha with um, Christian monasticism, as we've known mm. it up until really very recently, mm. even in America here, primarily Roman Catholic, but not ex not exclusively. Mm -hmm. um, you know, okay. many of us, many people my age were educated by nuns. Yeah, who gave up wearing yeah. robes like yours when we were tiny children. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. Um, from the little I know about Catholic monasticism, 
Although before setting up the abbey, I did go to some Catholic monasteries and ask them how they do things, and it was very helpful to learn from them. But one difference is um, they enter an order, so you enter either a teaching order, a meditation order, uh, a, a service order, like with the hospitals or whatever, and so you kind of do the one job according to the order that you enter. In Buddhism, we don't enter orders like that. And so as a monastic, there are some times where we study more, sometimes where we offer service, sometimes where we do meditation retreat. So there's much more flexibility in terms of our lifestyle and doing different things at different times. Yeah, so that's one difference. Then also in terms of the precepts, I think, first of all, the Catholics call it vows. And we call, sometimes it, Westerners call it Buddhist vows. It's more accurate to call it precepts or guidelines because a vow is something you take and you promise you will never abrogate or else. Whereas in, in Buddhism, of course we try and keep our precepts and not break them. But the idea is, if you were able to keep them perfectly, you would not need to take them. Yeah, so they're actually trainings they're guidelines. This is how we train our mind, how we train our body, how we train our speech. So the attitude is a bit different. Yeah. The Catholics have obedience. What is it? Ch poverty. Yeah, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Okay. Um, so it's very, it's three, you know. We have fully ordained nuns in the Dharma Guptaka lineage that, that I belong to. We have 348 precepts, okay? <laughs> so there's a lot more. And the idea is that they cover um, many, many different areas of your life. Yeah. When um, the five lay precepts to abandon killing stealing, unwise and unkind sexual behavior, lying and intoxicants. Those are five general uh, categories, you know. When you become a novice, you add five more precepts to that. There's 10 novice precepts, okay? When you become fully ordained, then you get many, many more, okay? That deal with uh, very with more detailed aspects of your life, and many of them have to do with your life uh, in the community. But they all, um, almost all of them, can be traced back to, you know, some of these initial five. Not all of them, you know, but many of them are basically more detailed aspects of killing or more detailed aspects of stealing or of lying, okay? So, so it's quite interesting. For example, we have one precept um, when you're going on alms round uh, or when you're eating, you're not supposed to cover your rice with vegetables or cover your vegetables with rice. The idea being that um, when you're on alms round, you gratefully accept whatever people give you. You don't try and make it look like you have less of the stuff you like so that they'll give you more of it, okay? So that's actually a division of lying because it's deceptive, yeah? So abandoning that kind of deceptive and in it points out a particular way that you do it, okay? So many of the precepts, you know, are more detailed aspects yeah, of the, the basic uh, fundamental precepts. Does that answer your question okay? 
um, if you have specific things that you want to know, if the Catholic nuns do and do we do them, I'm happy to help with that. But, yeah. but I think what is common is commitment to a spiritual path. And to community. And to community, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And that you're making uh, a lifelong commitment. In Buddhism, it is easier to disrobe than in Catholicism because the Catholics have to petition the Pope. Uh, we don't have to because there's no Pope. Uh, yeah, but uh, still, it, you know, it's, both of them are founded on, on making that commitment. Um, I missed something that you said about the Arya Sangha. Mm -hmm. they, they have the realization of emptiness yeah. forever. Mm -hmm. But then you said something that went by so fast I missed it. They can be lay or ordained? Yeah, you, but, can, you can have the realization of the direct realization of emptiness as a lay person. You can gain that realization or as a monastic. So why is the word sangha included in that title, title okay. or definition? Be because when we say the sangha jewel, the actual sangha that we take refuge in, that has the ability to guide us, can be one individual who has that realization, the direct realization of emptiness. Somebody with that depth of practice it doesn't matter whether they're lay or monastic, they, can, they are a reliable guide. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. And that's why the Sangha community, which is different than the Arya Sangha, the Sangha community of four more fully ordained people, yeah, they're not all necessarily Aryas, they could be four common people. Okay, but because there's four of them and they're keeping precepts, there's a certain energy and ability to guide that comes from that. Okay, but the real Sangha that can guide us are the people with this deep uh, understanding of the nature of reality. And that's the jewel? Yeah, that's the Sangha jewel. Okay. In... in uh, uh, Gyu Lama, um, the sublime continuum, there's eight qualities of the Sangha jewel. Has Bob been going through, those of you who have taken the class, was he going through the, the new Tara Tantra? Yes. Yeah, and going through the eight? He yeah. Hasn't gotten to the Sangha jewel. Okay, yeah, he'll get to it. You can speak about it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, if I do, I'll take out my computer so that, the, so that I remember the eight accurately. But we're, we're also a little bit getting near closing time. Other questions? Okay. I always tell people, don't think my question's stupid. I'm not going to ask it. And then Afterwards, everybody makes a line to <laughs> ask your question now. Anybody? Yeah? Just had a question about the path for Tibetan um, ordination for nuns, what the status of that is. Mm -hmm. The status is? Um, you mean in terms of the bhikshuni ordination? Uh, things haven't changed a whole lot. They, uh, a few years ago, I think, a, a group of the abbots and Rinpoche's and so on, they said, well, it's okay if the nuns go to the Chinese tradition and take the ordination there. But the Tibetan nuns, by and large, they will not do that because uh, they need to be able to do a lot of the Sangha functions together with monks. So they want to be ordained in the same tradition as the monks who are their teachers. So I don't think they're going to do that. What has happened is the Karmapa, um, 
really wants to introduce the full ordination for women into the Tibetan tradition. His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, wants to too, but people are very, very conservative. But the, the Karmapa is stepping up, at least in the Kargyu tradition. And so he, uh, his idea is to have uh, a, an ordination ceremony where the nuns are from the Chinese tradition. They follow the Dharma Guptaka Vinaya. And the monks are Tibetan and follow the Mula Srivastavada Vinaya. But then the nuns that they ordain in this dual ordination will be Mula Srivastavada, the, Tibet, the tradition of the Tibetans. And so what he's done so far to start on that is last February, um, some nuns from Taiwan came to Bodh Gaya, and then he had 19 nuns, Tibetan nuns, that he had uh, screened very well. And the uh, Chinese nuns gave them the novice ordination, the shramanari ordination. And that, uh, in, in the Tibetan community, usually the monks give that because there's no fully ordained nuns, but actually it should be given by the bhikshunis. So he had the, the Chinese bhikshunis give them that. Then I think in another year or two, he's going to have the Chinese bhikshunis give them what's called the shikshamana ordination, which is a two-year like probation or training period. And then after that, then have the bhikshuni ordination with the Chinese nuns and the Tibetan monks. So I think that's his plan, but that will unfold over a period of years. Yeah. I have a question. Mm-hmm. Okay. At what point that right, okay. In the Tibetan tradition, we have three levels of vows, and they're completely separate ordinations, so to speak. So one is the Pratimoksha vow, and that includes the five lay precepts, as well as all the different kinds of monastic precepts, the novice, the training nun, the fully ordained. Those are all in the Pratimoksha, or individual liberation category. Yeah, and those uh, regulate uh, actions of our body and speech. Yeah. Then, higher than that, you have the Bodhisattva precepts, the Bodhisattva ethical code. And those regulate not only actions of body and speech, but also actions of mind. Okay. So they're more difficult to keep because you really need, you can break them without saying or doing anything. Yeah. Then the most difficult uh, ones are the tantric uh, commitments and the tantric uh, precepts. Yeah. And those are taken at the time when you take a tantric empowerment. And they're even more difficult to keep. So in the Tibetan tradition, uh, the, um, the lay people and monastics, you know, have some kind of pratimoksha that they can take. Then all of them can take the bodhisattva, all of them can take the tantric ethical codes. Okay? But it's good to kind of go gradually and know what you're getting yourself into. Yeah. If the Bodhisattva um, vow, uh, as you just described it, regulates um, mind and body, uh -huh. what does the tantric? Uh, also physical, verbal, and mental actions. But the, what the tantra regulates is even more subtle. The mental actions there are much more subtle than uh, the ones regulated with the bodhisattva precepts. Oh, okay. 
Um, well, one, with the, with the tantric precepts, um, you're supposed to maintain pure appearance at all times, seeing yourself uh, as the deity and the people around you as deities and the environment as the mandala. That's pretty hard to do all the time. <laughs> in fact, for some of it, some of us, if we get a few moments in every day, we're doing well. Okay? Yeah. 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 So how would we define mandala in that context? The, the environment of the deity. The deity, yeah. So that's, that's pretty difficult to do, you know, and to have that mindfulness of that all the time. So, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you do your chants in English? Yeah. Oh, at the Abbey? Okay. Um, of course, we do our mantras in Sanskrit because those are always done in Sanskrit. But our regular chanting is predominantly in English. You know, all of our daily chanting before teachings, after teachings, um, you know, all of that is in English. Yeah. And we've been able, not for all of it, but for some of it, we've, we've uh, have some very beautiful melodies that go with it. So, slowly, slowly, yeah. Doing that. Okay, let's sit quietly. I call this digestion meditation. Okay. So, uh, in this silent time, it'll just be a couple of minutes, but think about what you heard and try and apply it to your life. You know, remember it so you can take it home and use it in your own life. And then let's rejoice uh, at what we did this evening, rejoice at our good motivation and all the virtue or merit we accumulated as individuals and as a group. So just let your mind feel happy about what happened this evening. And then you can think of all that goodness or merit or virtue, whatever you, you want to call it as a ball of light in the center of your chest and you radiate that out to all the living beings thinking that as the merit we create it touches them it pacifies the afflictions in their minds brings them realizations of the Dharma so thank you all very much and um, you're all welcome to come visit the Abbey. Yeah. Get out of the concrete jungle <laughs> and go into a real forest with real trees. 